Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 23, A View from France of U.S. Collapse, featuring Ali Valkyrie. Ali Valkyrie is a social activist, writer, artist, spirit worker, and co-founder of Gods and Radicals Press. Though she is a U.S. American citizen, she has been living in France for the last few years. We spoke on July 6th mostly about the many ways in which French and European cultures differ from the U.S., specifically ideas of freedom, responses to COVID, the social safety net, education, and cultural memory. I really enjoyed our conversation. It was refreshing to be reminded that the way things are in the U.S. is not the way things are everywhere. Are you from Oregon originally? Is that where you're from? No, I'm from right outside New York. Oh, okay. Um, I grew up in suburban New Jersey, right outside New York City. And so I gravitated toward the city and was kind of part of you know the anarchist scene there from maybe 1999 to like 2007. And then I moved to Eugene and lived in, you know, half the time Eugene, half the time in Portland for nearly a decade um, until I ditched Portland for France. Ah, okay. So I've, I was got, in, I've got roots in both places. Right. I was in Portland 2001 to 2010. So we overlapped slightly. Okay. Around. I first visited Portland, yeah, 2004. I, I went out to Eugene. I had a friend who, who was part of the Cascadia Forest Defenders who basically came out to New York to like try to recruit people to go live in the woods. And I was like, you know, 22 years old at the time. I had nothing going on in my life. I was like, yeah, what the fuck? I'll go live in a tree. Okay. <laughs> That's great. And so I flew to Oregon and I fell in love with it. And I spent like six weeks in Oregon, went back to Brooklyn. That was right around the time Brooklyn was starting to gentrify. And I just kind of watched all the neighborhoods I love turn to like boho asshole fucking, you know, and then my rent doubled one day and I was like, you know, I know somewhere I can go. So I sold most of my possessions and packed my van and drove to Eugene. And that's how I ended up in Eugene. Nice. And then, so yeah. how long have you been in France? Almost three and a half years now. Uh -huh. um, I made like the, you know, Reed and I came out here in early 2016. We did sort of like a pilgrimage trip type thing that we, we documented through Gods and Radicals. Um, yeah, that was spring 2016. I had never been to Europe before. Um, he had been here many times, so he was kind of the leader on that. Um, and when we, we ended up in Rennes completely by accident, we were supposed to go to Spain and there was a transit strike and all the trains were down and we were stuck in Toulouse and he was kind of like, you know, I know this really cool place in Brittany. Da, 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 da. And so we ended up here and I ended up kind of hooking up with like the leftist community here and totally fell in love with it. Went back to the U S and it was kind of a mirror of like when I went to Oregon and went back to New York, it was the same thing. I sat at home for a few months and I was like, you know, fuck this. And uh, four or five months later, I woke up one day. I was like, I'm going to sell everything I own and move to France. And I called Reed up. I was like, hey, do you want to move to France? And he was like, yeah, why not? And so we both moved to France. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's yeah, great. Yeah, that was March 2017. We ended up here permanent. And, yep. Yeah, still here. Definitely not going back anytime soon, I got to say. Uh, especially oh. with what going on now jesus fucking christ certainly yeah now, i haven't been to europe since 1997 and i was not very politically engaged at that time so i'm really fascinated reading your observations because you're looking at the things that i would be looking at if i was there now you mm -hmm. know and and seeing these differences and um one thing that you uh wrote about recently uh was the concept of freedom and how that's a different concept in the United States versus Europe. And of course, Europe's a bunch of places, I know, but there's still, so it seems like there's a generalization different. you can still make of the U.S. versus there. Oh, yeah. 
I got a story about that too. So when Reed and I were here, is this, are we recording by the way? We, we are now. Okay. But yeah, this is a story worth telling. So when Reed and I were here in 2016, we were here when the Pulse shooting happened in Orlando. Ah. And here in Hren, you know, in Brittany, there's often lots of Brits, but not a whole lot of Americans. And so when that happened, you know, it made international news. But him and I were kind of like the token Americans in the city at the time that this happened. So naturally, like anyone who could muster a, a sentence in English was kind of looking at us like, what the fuck? You know, like, can can you explain this? And so I remember we were at a bar one night and we were surrounded by like these university students. I mean, they were kids. They were like 21, 22. They were philosophy majors. They spoke English pretty well, but they were just like determined to understand the gun issue in the United States. Right. And, you know, I'm used to explaining it like between right and left in the United States. But, you know, contextually speaking, it's, it's more difficult to get foreigners to understand like the American obsession with guns. So, you know, like after that, yeah, this one kid, I remember looking at me like, like, why? Like, why do y'all, you know, and, and I tried, you know, first I tried to explain like the settler history of the United States, you know, poor immigrants sent into the Midwest, like you can have free land, but here you have to defend it. And like being like, you know, handed a rifle, you know, I, I, I tried like all the angles, right. And I could just tell that it just, it wasn't gelling contextually and you know both me and this kid you know we're dealing with a cultural barrier and a language barrier and he's just not grasping it so I went to what you know in retrospect was kind of like the cheap answer or I was like you know what for Americans it's freedom like I don't know what to tell you for Americans it's freedom and he starts to laugh he just starts to crack the fuck up <laughs> you know, like he's slightly drunk but at the same time I'm like what like what's so funny and he looks at me he's like you know what freedom means over here? And I was like, no, what? He's like, freedom means we get to go into a nightclub without having to worry we're going to get shot. <laughs> and it was like, boom. Right. You know, if it was a chess game, you know, it was like stalemate, you know, it was like, boom. Oh, wow. And it really made me, you know, it was the first time I ever really, like in a real sense, you know, like ph philosophically speaking, you know, like book speaking, right? I always understood that, the American concept of freedom was pretty damn narrow, but like that was the first time that like that concept was ever really shoved in my face. And, you know, the longer I'm here, especially after I moved here, you know, I mean, what it really comes down to, you know, it's like, it's like FDR and the four freedoms, right? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, freedom from fear. Americans embrace those first two, but it's those freedom from pieces that Europeans consider equally important. Right. So, you know, like from an American perspective, we say, yeah, you know, you can wave the swastika because that's free speech. From a European perspective, they say, no, Jewish people have a right to be free from having to walk down the road and see a fucking swastika. And it's just, it's a much bigger idea. You know, again, there's these like the from and the two that are constantly balanced where the American concept of freedom is basically like, you know, I can do whatever the fuck I want and you don't get to tell me what I can do. And if you try to tell me what I'm going to do, you're, you're infringing on my freedom. Right. Yeah. I, I grew up in, in Nebraska. And so this concept of freedom is I get to do what I want, you know, is like very familiar to me. Oh, like totally. that. It's a uh, really a belligerent thing is what it is. Exactly. You know? And, and so I, I've, that's always been there. I've always seen it. You know, I, I moved, uh, you know, first to the East Coast and then the West Coast to get away from that, that kind of thing. And uh, it is better on the coasts than it is in the mm -hmm. middle in terms of that, you know. But yeah. now, now we're in this place where it's like, this isn't just a, a philosophical argument anymore. Right. Now, it's coming down to be a public health issue. Right. And I'm really, myself, more fucking pissed off about this issue now than I have been in my entire life. And mm -hmm. I'm 51 years old. Yeah, no people. Exactly. The whole like, you know, wearing a mask is an infringement on my freedom versus, well, shouldn't I have a freedom to not be infected by your germs? Exactly. No, that's really it. It's the two verses from and Americans. They do. They have such this narrow conception, you know, like, and just the, I mean, the word, 
the way I react to the word liberty, you know, like the, just the way I react nowadays to these American conceptions of freedom. I literally like I have physical visceral reactions after being here for, for three and a half years now because it's just such a different mentality here. And whereas, you know, I mean, it's definitely not at all, you know, it's not perfect. You know, Europe has its issues with, with the way it, it, it conceives of freedom as well. But, but overall, you know, just, just that idea that, you know, we need to balance those two sides of freedom just, just leads to a much less chaotic society overall. And, you know, and I'm constantly dealing with pushbacks, you know, from, you know, I mean, just, you know, for example, with COVID, right? You know, when France started the confinement, you know, I was explaining to people the severity of it and they were horrified. They're like, wow, that's such an infringement on freedom. And I was like, yeah, but you know what? Four months later, I have the freedom to go to a movie theater without worrying I'm taking my life in my hands and you don't. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Because right now the the numbers are are higher every single day in the U.S. Oh, right now, it's, it's totally hard. spiking. I'm, it's a disaster here. I, I I made like the you know Lawsaw mistake of of just I just was look just for personal reference. I just looked up the difference between France and the United States over the past week, and I'm like it's even worse than I thought. And, you know, and it's absolutely horrifying. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, I mean, there's many reasons, but the primary reason is because people here accepted an extreme restriction of freedom for two months with the understanding that by doing that, they would get their lives back. And so many parts of America just rebelled against any sort of restriction on their, their quote unquote civil liberties and now it's just spiraled out of control to the point where, you know, I kind of feel it, it's past, you know, you, it's past the tipping point. I don't know what's going to happen, but like, I mean, it, it's absolutely fucking horrifying watching how, how hard, how high the numbers are in the U.S. right now. Can you tell us some more details about exactly what that was like in France, just so that people can get an idea of what we sure. should have done? Um, well, first of all, you know, the the lockdown was uniform nationwide. I mean, that's I think that's a really important thing to stress. You know, the United States acts like 50 different countries. And sometimes that has its advantages. Right. You know, I mean, I, I have very you know, I can argue foreign against federalism till my throat goes sore. I mean, it's a very complicated <laughs> subject. But when it comes to things like a pandemic, Federalism works greatly, greatly, greatly against the United States. And, you know, and even like, you know, I heard people saying, well, you know, this would have been so different under a different president. And I'm like, no, I don't. I mean, it would have been somewhat different. I mean, you wouldn't have had a different president wouldn't have been specifically and deliberately stoking, you know, the fires of, of division um, and specifically like being anti-science for the, the, the fun of it. Um, but I don't know if it would have been all that much better under any other leader because every state pretty much has the authority to do what it wants. And so the response to the United States would have been different across state borders no matter what. Whereas here, the response was uniform nationwide and the borders were closed. And not only the borders were closed, but, you know, they were very, very, very severe. Even after we started opening again, there were very strict travel restrictions to prevent anyone from an area with a higher infection rate to traveling to an area with a lower infection rate. But, you know, like watching what happened in the United States, you know, for example, the idea of what's an essential business, right? I mean, I watching Americans, watching state by state, watching people argue what was and wasn't essential really just maybe want to drink. Um, here, the only things that were open were grocery stores, pharmacies, newsstands, and medical facilities. That's it. Everything mm -hmm. else was closed. No takeout, no hardware stores, no equivalent of Walmart, no crafting stores, all these things that I saw in the United States that remained open, no childcare facilities, those were all closed. Um, we literally needed a permission slip to leave the house. The only reason you could leave the house was to either go to one of those four places to walk your dog or to exercise up to an hour a day. And there was a government affidavit that you had to print off the government website. You literally needed papers to leave the house. And there were police absolutely everywhere. 
checking people's papers to make sure that, that, you know, and you had to fill out the date, the time, your name, your address. And not only could you only go to one of those four things and or walk your dog or get exercise, but you weren't allowed to go, at least in urban areas, farther than a kilometer, so half a mile for Americans, away from your home, unless the store, you know, unless there was no store within a kilometer, right? So, you know, that was eight weeks, like uniformly nationally, we went through eight weeks of no one being able to leave their house unless they needed to pick up a prescription, go to the doctor, buy a newspaper or buy food. Right. And, and, you know, and one of the other major differences, you know, and I'll throw this at all the people who, you know, cry about socialism, right? And, and, you know, and again, it's really hard for for me to watch because, you know, one of the other reasons the lockdown succeeded here is because we have a strong social welfare state. So, you know, for example, you know, in the United States, the answer was to up the unemployment payments and to encourage everyone to apply for unemployment. But unfortunately, you know, in at least half the states, their unemployment bureaus, their unemployment softwares, you know, are three decades out of date. And so it, it, it created, I mean, I have friends in Oregon who are still trying to get unemployment from fucking March. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, I remember New Jersey putting out a call. I forget the name of the coding program, but they were looking for people who knew this like obscure coding language from the 1970s because right. that's what their unemployment software was still written in. And they needed to expand it because all of a sudden they have like 5 million people demanding unemployment. And, you know, there was no one under 60 who still knew that language. You know, watching that, you know, all I could sit here, you know, I, I always knew on a, an intellectual level that the United States was approaching, you know, third world country status. But, like, watching that go down in real time, you know, it, it, it was just, it was such a mind fuck. You know, here and throughout most of Europe, they went through a much, much simpler process where, you know, the government said to businesses, look, if you furlough your employees instead of fire them, we will refund you for 70% of their income. And so the vast majority of people here stayed home and got paid 70% of what they would normally get paid. And it was a very, you know, the 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 bit local businesses didn't have to wait three months dealing with an antiquated system built in 1974 in order to gain those payments. They were a, everyone was able to gain those payments here and now. Um, in addition, you know, um, so just to back up a bit, uh -huh. in France in general, always, um, between November 1st and April 1st, there is a prohibition on evictions. Um, it's called the Treve Ivernal. It's just, it's an, it's an ethical decision that the state has always made. Even if you can't pay your rent, they cannot evict you between November and April. Um, they extended that till July. So even for people who theoretically fell through the cracks, you know, whether it was, you know, people who were working contract gigs or people who were working under the table, those who for some reason or another were not were not able to gain a paycheck even at 70 percent, they still weren't being evicted. Nobody was being evicted. Um, even now, you know, they, they've now like extended that further where, you know, it's past July 1st now. But because of the crisis, they decide, you know, even if you can become evicted, there will be mandatory housing for you. They'll put you in social housing. They'll put you in state funded housing. Um, so, you know, having and, you know, and France has amongst the most, you know, arguably the most generous uh, social safety net for the poor in all of Europe. But, you know, most European countries had a similar scheme going on when it came to either the furlough of workers or a nationwide ban on evictions. And so we were able, you know, the other thing that happened here that was super crucial was, um, you know, all the schools were closed. And so, you know, outside of a pandemic, right, if you become sick here um, and if you're sick enough not to go to work, after three days, you get what's called an archete travail, where basically your doctor signs a bunch of forms that you give to your boss and your boss has to pay you for being sick for as long as you're sick. Um, and, you know, and your boss gets refunded by the state for, for so as long as you're sick, for as long as you're sick months, like I had a friend who ended up with a chronic wrist issue. She was working in an old age home. Um, she was able to stay home for five months. Wow. In a salary. If your doctor says you're staying home, you're staying home. You miss the first three days of pay. And after three days, if it's severe enough, you get paid. You don't get paid a hundred percent. I forget the percentage, but you get paid enough to survive. 
So um, the French state decided to extend that benefit for parents with children. Um, you know, if, you're, if your child was stuck at home and both parents were working and you didn't have childcare arrangements, the government extended that sick leave to parents so that parents could take care of their children. Oh, that's wonderful. So, you know, the combination of all those benefits made it so that, you know, we could go through those two months without being nearly as severely um, economically affected as even a two to three week, not nearly as strict lockdown in the United States had. Right. right. And here, you know, they they did not lift the lock. The lock, lockdown was lifted regionally and it was lifted based on a combination of how full the hospitals were and how high the infection rate was. So eight weeks out, you know, it began like March 17th. If I remember correctly, the initial lifting was on May 11th, but they didn't lift it uniformly everywhere. Um, Paris and then like Eastern France near Strasbourg, um, that's where the virus was the most severe. They didn't lift all the restrictions immediately in those areas because the hospitals were still overburdened because there was still an active infection rate. Um, but in order to, you know, make sure that that infection rate didn't spread when they lifted the restrictions, they instituted a travel restriction. Um, one could not go more than 50 kilometers from their house. Um, unless they had like a very, like there was a very narrow list of government exceptions to that. But you had police in every urban area, you know, checking any car that was from out of the region, seeing where they were going, seeing where they lived, seeing where they were from. So that, you know, that kept the virus from spreading from point A to point B. And, you know, and it was super like, you know, New York City, for example, had amongst the strictest lockdowns in the country. And overall, it was pretty damn successful. But the fact that there was no travel restriction meant that people from the middle of Pennsylvania, people from the middle of Virginia, people from tons of areas that didn't have nearly as severe of a lockdown were able to travel to New York City, were able to travel wherever they wanted and bring the infection with them. And in many ways, the sacrifices that New Yorkers made, I mean, you could say, you know, San Francisco had a similarly strict policy, much of California did. Those sacrifices were in vain because there was nothing that prevented people whose governors didn't give a shit um, from traveling to those areas and bringing the infection with them. I think that in the United States, a governor actually can't close their borders, right? Because that's interstate travel. Right. Again, mm -hmm. yep, federalism. Again, you know, and that's the problem. Right. And, you know, again, I understand the history behind those policies. I, I understand why it is how it is. But in a situation like this, it, it kind of left things doomed to fail. And that's why, you know, when I hear people go, oh, this would have been better under a different leader. I'm like, no, like there, there's like literally constitutional provisions <laughs> that would have prevented the response because the response in France was the response. I mean, except for Sweden. Sweden is the official EU pariah state. Sweden, you know, took the the controversial different road and very much messed up. And that's why, you know, Schengen is open everywhere except for Sweden. Um but pretty much every other, you know, EU member state did the same thing as France did in terms of having a uniform, incredibly strict shutdown with border controls and travel restrictions. And so, you know, over here right now, you know, we see little spikes here and there. But overall, at least for now, you know, we expect I mean, we expect a second wave. Nobody is going to delude themselves. I have no doubt that there will be another lockdown before this is all over. But for right now, for the most part, we have our lives back. And I'm watching what's happening in the U.S. and it's absolutely tragic. So when you went out um, uh, and you had to have papers and there were police around, so did you uh, have an instance where you were stopped and told to show your papers? Yep, I was stopped once. Okay. Um, I will say, you know, police being police, they definitely targeted not white people who looked like immigrants uh, much more than, you know, and I am an immigrant, right? But I don't look like one. Right. Um, I was able to walk past, I want to say three or four stop areas, you know, control points without being checked. But there's one time, yeah, I was checked, you know, and they were, they were strict as hell. You know, they were, they were cops being cops. They asked for my ID. They asked for my papers. They quite, you know, where did you come from? What time, you know, they were like, asking me everything that was on the paper to make sure I was answering correctly based on what the paper was written. 
Um, they looked in my bag to make sure I had actually groceries because that's where I was coming from, the grocery store. Um, gave me a nasty look and let me go. Uh huh. What was the punishment uh, if you were caught lying about this stuff? It was a fine that ranged, like basically deciding on how much of a jerk the officer wanted to be. It was a fine that ranged anywhere from about 300 U.S. to 1,500 U.S. Right. Um, for, for multiple infractions, it was much, much higher. Right. That I've, I've wondered about that part myself, you know, here in the U S where I've been like, I I've been wishing that we've been more strict the whole time. And then at the same time, I've been like, but what do you do for the fine part? Because this isn't a country where people can afford fines. So what's the, what should we do about that part of it? You know what I mean? Yep. No, I mean, I, you know, I, I'll admit, you know, I was really, really good about the rules because I couldn't afford the fine. But again, you know, they, they created a scenario in terms of, you know, the exceptions and the safety net that, that's already existing here where most people didn't have a reason to break the rules. And so, you know, that severe fine, I think, kept people. I mean, there were a few people who broke. The, I mean, you know, we live behind. Um, right behind our house, there's um, a sports complex that's owned by the National Railroad. It's it's meant for their employees. Um, but since that was all closed down, it was kind of like a bunch of local teenagers who, you know, went back there every night and got drunk. And frankly, it's perfect because it's secluded enough that the cops generally don't go back there. And I could tell from my window that they were back there regularly, you know, despite the confinement. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Probably, not all that worried about fines. You know, it was three in the morning. And I heard shouting and laughing and, you know, I'm not going to get angry. It's like, you know, live life just, you know, especially here, you know, I mean, I, I live in Brittany, you know, it's a, it's, it's a peninsula. So we're surrounded by water on three sides, but we're also, we're very geographically isolated from the rest of the country for most of the year. Um, everyone else comes here in the summer for tourist season, but considering that this, you know, pandemic hit in late February, you know, nobody comes to Brittany in February. It's like Seattle. It rains every day from November to April, and it's miserable, and nobody wants to be here. Um, so because of the lack of people going in and out, and especially, you know, knowing how travel is what really uh, moves this this virus from one place to another, um, we were amongst the least hit places in the country. Right. Uh, and still are. So, you know, even though I, you know, recognize that, you know, these like kids are breaking the rules and getting drunk behind my house every single night, you know, when I would look at the numbers every single day in this region, I wasn't that concerned. Right. You know, it's like they, statistically, they're probably not really doing much harm, um, especially specifically in, in the department that, um, that I live in. The numbers were extremely low. They're still extremely low. I mean, this region, you know, the, the Britannia region has around 3 million people and they're finding an average of eight to 10 cases a day. So, wow. you know, I'm wow. not all that worried. Um, I do fear, you know, for the future, you know, tourist season has started. People are now coming here from the rest of the country. Um, I have a feeling that, you know, by the end of August, we're going to see a raise in numbers, e even if it's not, folks internationally, just folks coming from regions with, with much higher infection rates. Um, the, the freedom I have right now, I do think will not last, but, but I have it now. So I'm enjoying it now. That's kind of, that's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I think that, you know, in the United States, the lack of, of social support for people has been a cause of, of great distress and suffering for sure. You know, totally. Totally. I mean, I couldn't, I mean, and it was hard because, you know, when you looked at like the open up protests, right? Like they were being pushed by wealthy corporate interests, you right. know, especially like the ones in like Michigan being pushed by like the DeVos family and all those groups that are associated with them, mm -hmm. you know, but the people who are being sucked into it, the people who were out there, you know, they're legitimately like facing, you know, I can't pay my bills. And that was really, really hard to watch, you know, as as an American citizen living abroad who knows full well that the social safety net in the U.S. is next to non-existent. You know, I, I, I mean, I was angry at, you know, I was like, no, <laughs> you don't understand, like, like, you don't want to open up right now. But yeah, I mean, one $1,200 stimulus check, you know, that millions of people still haven't gotten, I mean, that it, it 
and it's kind of sad for me because I was kind of, you know, the, the super like Pollyanna part of me was kind of hoping that this incident would, would show a good chunk of the American working class that, you know, that, that this, uh, the uh, hatred of quote unquote socialism maybe isn't in their best interest. Um, you know, one thing I was looking at those protests and I was thinking, you know, if they were showing up armed on the steps of the Capitol demanding like a universal basic income, I would totally be in support of this. Right. But you know, your, your anger is misplaced, you know, like sometimes the, a basic social safety net it, it is, it helps everyone. It helps you, you know, and, and so much of the problem with the American mentality, you know, the idea, you know, if I work hard enough, everyone can make it, um, you know, this was a an episode in American history where, you know, at least in terms of like the lower middle class down to the poor, all of a sudden everyone was equalized. You know, all of a sudden everyone's making nothing all at once. All of a sudden, oh, look, it's not your fault. Like, see what it's like when something horrible happens and you can't pay your bills and it's not because anything you did. You know, this is why social safety nets exist. This is why the rest of the Western world has embraced what so many of you deride as, you know, the welfare state. Um, but unfortunately, you know, I don't see much, you know, and, and the real tragic part, you know, as much as I'm mixed feelings about him, I looked at like, you know, the the falling apart, the the last hopes of the Bernie Sanders campaign happening amongst this pandemic. Right. Right. <laughs> With Joe Biden getting up and going, no, I, I still think we don't need Medicare for all. I still, and I'm just like, oh my God, timing. Oh, yeah. timing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have a lot of criticisms of Sanders. I think it's a, it's a band aid on a jugular wound. But at the exact same time, if there was ever just a, a terribly painful collision of timing for like that hope to fail, right? Yes. It was at that moment. I'm just like, oh my, you know, like, no, actually, like the the things he's saying right now, if those were in place right now, you, you all would be like in so much better shape. <laughs> like it's not, oh yeah, it still makes me kind of want to cry. I, I totally felt that too. And I haven't voted for a Democrat for president since 1992. So you know, my, my, my politics are, you know, Bernie is, is, you know, very conservative, Mm -hmm. from my viewpoint but i also did get my hopes up a bit this year because i saw his following yeah how many young people were behind him and yep. how the ideas were being pushed forward and i'm like okay i'm gonna withhold my criticism here because actually we would be better off if this totally. person got more attention and if this person yep. got it we actually would and yep. The For overton the window has gone like you know just to the right 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 since Reagan. Yes. Well, I saw it. I saw it slowly but surely budge a bit to the left. Yes. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And it gave me like a little bit of light at the end of the time. I mean, I still, you know, I still think the American project is screwed long term. Oh, definitely. But, but people, you know, but one thing, you know, living here, you know, living amongst you know, a generous welfare state has taught me is that, you know, the less people are struggling, the more time and energy they have to fight back. Right. Right. And that's something that the United States really needs because, you know, as someone who tried to, you know, engage in leftist organizing in the United States for 20 years, you know, the number one thing I think we constantly came up against is, is burnout and just people literally not having the energy, even though they believe in it, even though they understand it, even though they're totally on board, you know, they're going to stop at signing petitions because they're working 50 hours a week and they have two kids without daycare and, you know, and they just, they can't. Whereas, you know, over here, people have a whole lot more time to, you know, throw bricks at a window of Starbucks. They just, <laughs> 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 and they're, they're a lot less afraid to do it because they have universal health care. And, you know, have, observing that as an American has just really made me realize where, you know, I, I'm, I will never be a fan of liberal democracy. Um, I don't think that, that, you know, social democracy is the answer, but it definitely would help the United States fight toward the direction that it needs to go in order to survive. Right. I mean, and yeah, there's there's so many things built into the U.S. American character from the beginning mm -hmm. to the individualism and all that that also makes it, you know, um, 
makes it a heavy lift, as they as they say here, you know. Yeah. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... One thing I'm curious about, too, is that I'm sure you've noticed that the uh, COVID-19 denialism is very strong in the United States. And I'm wondering, are you seeing that in, in France? No. Are you seeing that in Europe? No. No. I mean, not only is it very strong, but it's so American-centered. It's incredibly painful to watch as an American living abroad. It's like you really think that the entire world is faking a disease to hurt Trump's reelection chances? <laughs> like... I mean, that's really what y'all are saying. I mean, you really think that Italy sacrificed 33,000 lives so that Trump wouldn't get elected? Um, you know, I mean, Italy's pretty right wing. Like, I, 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 oh, my God. Yeah. No, that's that's not a thing here. If anything, um, I've been the go to for half this town trying to culturally translate <laughs> like how people can possibly believe these things. I mean, the, the more that, that the French learn about what Americans actually believe, they're just, I mean, I, I just for the first time today saw something somewhere. It wasn't a major publication. It was one of the minor about QAnon. Uh-huh. And, like, I, I can't even imagine once that goes mainstream as a, you know, hey, do you know Americans believe this shit? Um, how people are going to react. You know, last, last fall, I think, or no, maybe. Yeah, it was about a year ago. Um, the the biggest newspaper, regional newspaper in my region, did a story on flat earthers. And wow, when I walked into the bar that night, you know, I had like half a dozen people come up to me. Like, Is this really a thing? Like, wait a minute, do Americans really believe this? I was like, yeah, go on YouTube. Yeah, no, no, unfortunately, like they they cannot conceive that so many Americans, you know. And part of that is because you know. Since World War II, you know, and, and especially, you know, I can't speak for Europe as a whole, but especially in France, the younger generations have, they very much have rose colored glasses around what America is like, especially prior to Trump. Um, that's something I've had to constantly push back against here. You know, the youth, you know, between American culture, American music, American TV, you know, I mean, Hollywood does a better propaganda job than any government could in many, right. many, many ways. Um, and, you know, for me as an American that chose to leave, you know, when that subject comes up in, in random places, you know, anyone under 30 looks at me like, oh, my God, why? Oh, I want to live in America so bad. I want to live in L.A. And I'm like, you don't know anything about L.A. You don't want to live in L.A. You've watched thing up with the Kardashians. Like, you don't know. You don't know what it's like. But they, you know, they very much had this this very, you know, incredibly, I mean, the American dream, I've, I, I said, at least prior to Trump, the American dream felt stronger here than it did in the U.S. amongst the youth. Wow. Um, you know, I have a friend um, who I knew back, you know, I met her in New York years ago, but she's French and she's a she's an English teacher in the south of France. And she said to me many times, you know, she said, you know, I wish I could bring you into my class because all of my 16, they just want to move to New York. They just want to live in America. They just think it's the most amazing thing in the world. And, and anything I tell them, you know, she lived here for a year. I try to tell them over and over again, like they can't hear it because they've just been so dazzled by pop culture they've just been so convinced that america is the most the most amazing thing I'm like yeah it's amazing till you break your arm <laughs> 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 and then you're bankrupt you know like and so but that view has changed so quickly i mean trump was like the first push to change that but especially since the beginning of the coronavirus any time a, a discussion I'm in end up, ends up being about America, it just evolves into like, what the fuck? 
Like, how can they think this? How can they think that? How can how can they believe that the COVID-19 is a conspiracy to get rid of Trump? And, you know, and it's like, I don't have an, I'm like, I, I don't. I don't, this is why I left. <laughs> like, I don't want, I can't really enunciate exactly why they, be, I mean, so much of it has to do with just, you know, a, a complete and utter lack of critical thinking skills, um, you know, which, which the French have so much more concretely. Um, but, you know, it's just the brainwashing of, of mainstream media. You know, I mean, there's so many factors that have led to, you know, the American condition right now. But no, but this denialist stuff does not. I mean, th there's a, like a very, very, very fringe, very, very, very small fringe here that, that probably believes, you know, like they'll, they'll, they'll grasp onto the, you know, it was created in a lab, for example. This is Russia. This is China. Um, but nowhere, nowhere near the, the level of American denialism. Nobody here is arguing that masks will give you carbon dioxide poisoning. Um, like so many of the arguments, I'm nobody's really arguing that it's just the flu. You know, like, like th those things just do not fly here. Um, and, and people are just aghast at how much Americans are believing those things. And it's been very disappointing for me personally to see how the denialism around it has not been restricted to the right, that there's been nope. a lot of left-wing people and even a lot of anti-imperialists. Yep. Yep. Nope. That's, that has been, I mean, it's not shocking, but it's incredibly disappointing slash frustrating slash infuriating. <laughs> um it, it's been really, really hard to watch, especially with certain, you know, folks who who have been very much put up on the pedestal um, in our, our tiny little left wing world, um, who all of a sudden are, yeah, they're grasping these conspiracy theories. And, you know, the, the problem is, you know, all of them. And, and again, I get it. I get how the world works. But, you know, they, they have this fan base that will just cling to everything they say. And anyone who tries to push against it is just immediately blocked, immediately canceled, immediately exiled, immediately whatever. And yeah, no, no, see, seeing that proliferated amongst the left um, has, has definitely been stomach churning. Um, there's part of me that just wanted to say, you know, I, I would like to think that we were smarter than that. But again, you know, it's it's that, that lack of critical thinking ability. If there's any, like if there's any one change that I would like, you know, if, if I had like the benevolent dictator power in the United States right now and I could institute one change, it would be a change that exists here. I would mandate philosophy in all high schools <laughs> because philosophy is mandated in all French high schools. And you know what? It means that anyone here has basic critical thinking skills. They may not be like the, the brightest light bulb in the box. But they don't fall for bullshit the way that I'm watching so many Americans, some people in my own family, people who I love dearly, who are just so sucked in by this 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 web that the, you know the, the YouTube rabbit hole, whatever it be, um, and just the anti-science, the anti-intellectualism. Um, people here just don't fall for that the same way. There's bits of it, there's bits of it, but it's nowhere, nowhere near as mainstream. And because everyone here has, you know, a basic ability to critically think, again, they're, they're just, they're so confused. It, like, it ends up lost in translation. They are so confused as to how Americans could believe what they believe right now. Yeah, philosophy would help, and, and so would history, because, yeah. of course, yeah. pandemics of various kinds have been plaguing the human, you know, humans since we mm -hmm. began the civilization project like 6,000 yep. years ago or whatever, like, and so there's a degree to which we know the drill and have known the drill for centuries. Right. But see, the difference being, you know, Americans got, America has a broken history, right? Right. What happens with assimilation is that you forget the homeland. Right. Here. You know, people learn about that history. You know, we all know about, you know, the Black Plague in 1347, you know, but there's been a series of plagues since then. <laughs> there's been many, many plagues since then. And those are memories that, that are still existent amongst the population here. 
Um, and those are memories that were not preserved by those who, who, who emigrated, by those who, who went over to the United States. So, you know, that, that's been, you know, I, I've tried very hard to kind of be, be as polite as possible and reserve my judgment. But, you know, it's, it's the American tendency to refuse to look elsewhere. Yes. To think that America has all the answers, to think that, you know, it's that American exceptionalism at work, right? You know, it's like maybe, maybe, maybe you should pay attention to what Europe is doing because, you know, the word quarantine itself comes from Venice during the plague times. Even before they understood germ theory, they understood that if we leave everyone sick off the shore for 40 days, <laughs> that means we all don't die, right? Right. Like That's where the word quarantine comes from, right? Yeah. It has to do with 40 days. Yep. Yep. Qua yeah. Quaranta. Yeah. Quarantine. I say quarantine in, Fran um, in French. But yeah, but that, that, that originated in Venice during the Black Plague where any ship that was coming to shore they would require to stay off the port. Usually, I mean, they're, they're, st they're, they're still all over. A lot of them are kind of like historical monuments now, but there's all these little islands off the coast of ports in the Mediterranean, in France, in, his in Italy, um, even in Turkey, where the ship had to dock for 40 days. And the little island had, you know, basic food. It had running water. It had, you know, whatever you needed to survive. But if they had come from a city where there was documented plague activity, the requirement was that for 40 days, you need to stay on this little island. The idea being, you know, whoever's sick, either they're going to die or they're going to get better. Um, but you cannot come onto land for 40 days. Right. And, you know, that, that say, I mean, as many people who died throughout the plagues, that saved many, 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 many lives. And, you know, there, there were a few instances, I mean, for example, there's a fascinating story um, in Marseille. So Marseille is a port in southern France. It's not, it's, it's like the beginning of the French Riviera. It's not far from Nice. Um, and it's been historically important for at least a thousand years. And between like the Middle Ages and like the early part of the Industrial Revolution, it was without a doubt like the, the most wealthy port in France and one of the most wealthy ports in the Mediterranean. And so they had very, very strict policies based on what happened with previous plagues where, you know, there was enough communication between all the port cities that there was kind of a running list on any port city that had evidence of plague activity. Um, and so for any ship that was coming from any, any city that had documented plague activity, same thing. They had to go to this little island. They had to, they had to spend their 40 days. And so it was in the seventh, I want to say this, the first half of the 17th century. I, I forget the exact date, but there was a ship that came into Marseille um, and it had stopped in Turkey and Greece and Italy, but it stopped at two or three cities where it was known on the list that the plague was a problem. And, and so, you know, the, the city councilors, everyone was trying to, they were trying to follow, you know, the, the, the protocol that was always followed. But, on the ship were an incredibly um, valuable amount of textiles. And every year in southern France, there was this huge, um, how would you say it? I forget English sometimes, like a market, right? Like a wholesale market where people came from all over Europe to trade in textiles. And amongst the textiles on the ship, many of them had been bought by one of the city councillors who needed to get those textiles off the ship ASAP in order to make his money. Um, the ship had come into Marseille in late May. I believe the, the, the market was in early July and the city councilor didn't ha want to have to wait out the two months, the six weeks. And so he paid off a bunch of people and twisted a lot of arms and convinced the city to allow the ship to dock prematurely, basically so he could make his fortune. And in a city of 100,000, 50,000 people were dead three months later. Dear Lord. Um, early half the city died of the plague. They built plague walls around Marseille um, that exist to this day. You can still see them in Provence. Um, they built plague walls to try to keep everyone in Marseille in Marseille, to keep them from traveling, from spreading the plague. Uh, and the penalty was death to cross the plague walls. 
but enough people snuck over nonetheless that it spread throughout Provence. And I believe 100,000 people by the end of it ended up dead because one rich governmental asshole wanted to have his textiles for the sake of what capitalism, right? Um, I think about that story. I mean, I thought about that story a million times when I heard Americans complaining about the the uh, rules that were put down for their not very strict lockdowns. Um, but, you know, that's the history of France. That's the history of Europe. You know, historically, those were the steps that were taken because they knew how devastating pandemics could be. So there there's a living history of that here that just does not exist the same way in the United States. Um, and there's also, you know, the individualism versus communalism, right? You know, America, me, 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 I got mine. And, you know, here there's much more an emphasis on the social good, the good of the people as a whole being valued more than the individual need or desire. So, you know, when the entire country was told to lock down, you know, we weren't happy about it. Like we complained, um, uh -huh. <laughs> but, but you didn't have the, you know, but I want to get a haircut, but that's more important as, as you had in the United States where, you know, it's that the whole ideology of rugged individualism, which, you know, birthed the nation, which has always been there, uh, which Trump has just stoked the fires of more than ever. Um, and, you know, in many ways that that's been the, such a such a damaging difference between the two places where, you know, here people are willing to sacrifice a bit. I mean, it sucked. It was really awful being inside for eight weeks straight. But again, you know, now it means that I can go have a drink with friends without worrying that I'm going to infect half the town. Um, there was a reason for it. It paid off. That sacrifice paid off. But but so, you know. Overall, throughout the United States, the, ma the majority of, of areas in the U.S. wanted to cut corners, both for economic reason and because of citizen anger. And they're paying for that very, very dearly now. And the places that didn't cut corners are the places I feel the worst for. You know, New York went through a 77-day quarantine, and their numbers are going up again because of people from elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 terrible. I, it's really quite something to be looking at the news and be like, "Wow, this is one of the worst places to be in the world right now." Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, it's terrifying. I mean, you know, and here, I mean, especially right now, you know, in my region, you know, most people aren't wearing masks. Um, but the politics, I mean, the politics around that are very different. The history around that is very different. You know, it's not really comparable to the United States, um, and it doesn't worry me i mean why well, say you know stores where it's demanded people don't fight about it you know we, we haven't had any instances where people are being attacked or shot at because because someone's demanding they wear a mask um that's very unique to the united states but i will say you know if i was in the united states now yeah i'd be scared shitless like i'd be wearing a mask everywhere i, I would not want to leave my house um it's really, really terrifying. And again, just watching the resistance in the face of just so much, you know, science, like science is your friend, kids, science is your friend. <laughs> uh, it's just that's that anti-intellectualism. That's just such an, such an enormous cultural difference between here and there. And it's one of the things that people here have a, the hardest time trying to grasp, you know, especially the, the strain of it that comes out of fundamentalist Christianity in the United States and the Southern States and, you know, the, the Christian homeschool movement and just all of this, you know, people literally being raised, having no concept of basic scientific principles, including, you know, basic principles around viruses and germs. I mean, the United States was, was one of the last Western countries in the world where, you know, you still had preachers at the turn of the century insisting the germ theory wasn't real. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, well, and there's been a and, resurgence and, in that too. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I've, I've watched and it, and it's just, it's absolutely horrifying. Um, and there's just so many people needlessly put being put at risk right. and it, you know, on one hand I say it shouldn't have to be that way. And on the other hand, again, when I look at all the factors, it's like, I don't necessarily I can't imagine it having been any other way 
given the the material conditions in the United States, you know, the combination of the politics, the federalism, the decades worth of brainwashing, um, the the anti intellectualism, the the you know left right red blue divide, you know, all of the factors that have been building for decades now have just kind of converged. And whereas, you know, I've been saying for years, you know, I, I, I had no doubt that I would watch the United States self-destruct in my lifetime. I didn't think it, I, I didn't have pandemic on my bingo card. You know, I didn't see it happening. I mean, you had commented before, you know, what, what Patrick Farnsworth said earlier is like, I knew it would self-destruct, but I didn't think it would be, they'd, people would be quite so stupid and quite so <laughs> willing. Like, I'm like, yeah, that's really it. Like, I did not see it coming like this. I didn't see it coming like this either. And I knew from an early age, you know, had the strong feeling from an early age that I would see a collapse here as well, because it just seemed to be on its way. So, I, you know, from my 20s, at least I knew this, you know, well, from my yep. teens in some way. So I've known from the 80s, you know, to one degree or another. But yeah, I didn't suspect that pandemic would would be would, would go down like this because it it just seems pretty elementary. Oh, infectious disease. Do the things to be careful to not <laughs> spread it. Like what? <laughs> what the fuck it's is so right. hard to understand yeah. about that? Exactly. And again, the rest, you know, the rest of the world, the entire world is just looking at the U.S. right now, just shaking their heads. Like, what's wrong with you? But most people in the United States don't even realize that because Americans just don't look at anything outside their borders. And the degree to which that's now just become absolutely deadly, that can you know, combine with the denialism, define, combine with the conspiracy theories. I'm just, it, it, it's stunning. And I'm not shocked by much, you know. Uh, again, I predicted Trump. I predicted lots of, you know, pretty much everything that happened up to this point. I had on my bingo card, so to speak. But this, I was like, really? You're, you're not, you're going to rather die than wear a mask? Okay. Like, I, pfft. I got nothing. I got yeah. nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's just really showing the depth of the stupidity. I mean, and it, and it's it has to do with the. I mean, it does feel like it kind of all goes back to settler colonialism too, and the mm -hmm. the individualism and the paranoia yeah. that goes with that. Yeah, I mean, I'm all you know. The, the French people don't trust their government either. You know, I mean, it, it's interesting too. Cause, you know, like the French state handled this pretty well overall. Right. Especially compared to America or Sweden. Um, but last time I checked, you know, Macron's uh, uh, approval numbers are lower than Trump's. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you know, the, the French hate their, you know, it's like the United States, the Americans mistrust their government in this conspiracy theory way. The French hate their government, like guillotine style. Right. It's different. <laughs> um, but even though they hate their government, they still trust, you know, experts. <laughs> so whereas you know people don't like macron when you know the minister of health gets up you know who's a phd who you know has a whole bunch of infectious disease experts next to him and says to the country we're gonna have to lock down until further notice people believe that right they, they don't think that's a conspiracy because again they they accept basic scientific principles Whereas the United States, it's like everything's a conspiracy. Everything's fake news. Everything, like, we can't believe anything except that one quack doctor on YouTube that everyone thinks they can believe. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it's it's absolutely mind-boggling the degree to which this distrust, I'm all for a healthy distrust of government. You know, there's never been an, an American presidential regime that I've quote-unquote trusted, right? Um, but, but you know, I, I, I do trust... You know, it's kind of the whole, you know, 98% of climate scientists say climate change is real, right? So I'm going to trust them over the 2% that say it's not. I mean, that's, <laughs> right. that's where I'm at with the pandemic. Like the vast majority of the world's experts say A, B, C, and D. And so I'm going to trust those folks and not that one guy who's not even an MD with the YouTube videos about why we don't need to wear masks. Right. I remember um, someone, this subject came up um, on Margaret Kiljoy's uh, timeline, and she was talking, and of course, her politics are anarchist. I mean, my, my mm -hmm. politics are basically anarchist as well. And she was saying that there's a difference between opposing authoritarianism, so like a, a repressive government, and then 
um, respecting the knowledge of authorities, people who are authoritative. Right. Yeah, no, I remember that. I think, you know, I'm an anarchist, but <laughs> I'm, there's certain things I'm going to believe here. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, there's a difference between not liking, you know, author, authoritarian structures and saying, well, you know, these folks studied this subject for a decade and I didn't. So I'm going to defer to them. Right. Because because I, I don't know much about infectious disease and public health policy. I never studied that. So I'm going to listen to the people who did. Yeah, but there's definitely um, this strain of uh, people feel like they're an expert on anything after seeing a half a dozen memes about it or something. And that's the problem, you know, and that's again, this is this is where lack of critical thinking, you know, it's just become this like toxic disease. I mean, we saw this long before the pandemic, you know, people who just decide that they're an expert. Um, and decide that, that they'll they'll put forth an opinion about something that they really don't understand at all. I mean, you know, the metaphor I always use, right? Like, I I don't know much about sports, right? So I would not walk into a sports bar, point at the football game on the TV and say, wow, that was a great first down. Because I don't know what happened on that screen. I don't even really know what a first down is. And if I was right. to reject my opinion like that, I'd look stupid. I would not walk into a car repair shop and point to the mechanic and go, no, I think you need to change the what jig because I don't know what that piece does. That guy's an expert. He has the, the certification. He's a mechanic. I'm not. Um, but there's far too many people who truly believe that they can just watch a YouTube video and all of a sudden they know just as much as a doctor who went through, you know, four years of medical school and four years of residency. Right. And that's just right. like biting us in the ass right now in a way that I never really imagined it would. Yeah. And like I said, I've observed this my whole life, but now the stakes are different. And so it exactly. really sucks. <laughs> Well, do you have any any advice for those of us who are uh, stuck here for now? <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, what needs to happen that's not going to happen is a national coordinated long term shutdown with a social safety net. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, in lieu of that, I would say stay home if you can. Like, I'm looking at this like I got no answer. I got no answer. Um, the people that can't be convinced aren't going to be convinced. And they're going to put other people in danger. Um, I'm terrified as to what this is going to mean come November. Like, I do think you will have a national shutdown. And if you do, it's going to be two weeks before the election. And it's going to be the, the perfect excuse for widespread voter suppression. Um, and, you know, one thing I've been saying all along is, you know, even if, if Trump doesn't theoretically win the election, he, he plans on staying in office. So, yeah, I would just say, you know, I know not everyone has the resources. I know not everyone has the privilege, but as much as you can protect yourself the best you can, because you can't you can't rely on your neighbor and you can't rely on the state. Right. I mean, do you think that I, how far away is, you know, failed state status? Depends what happens in November. Right. If, 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 if that goes down the way I think it's going to go down, if, if Trump ends up in the White House still on the 21st of January, whether through election or through military coup, you know, I, I would say what I've been saying for years, whereas if you can get the fuck out, get the fuck out. And if you can't get the fuck out, like bunker down and prepare for the worst. Um, you know, it's that whole, you know, part of ex American exceptionalism is the, you know, it can't happen here mentality. And I think, you know, more than ever, people are being shaken out of that. But, I, you know, I think that, that the average middle class American who's always felt that they're protected and comfortable really needs to look at the history of, you know, for example, the majority of Syrian refugees pouring into Europe right now, they're middle class. I did not know that. Yeah, they pour in with their iPhones. They weren't poor. They had lives that weren't all that different from the average American middle class person. And after a few years of civil war, they had nothing. And they're sneaking over borders the same way that the that, that people from sub-Saharan Africa are sneaking over borders, the same way that people from all over the world are sneaking over borders. Um, I would study Syria. Um, it can happen really fast. And it, it's happening, again, I always expected it to happen in my lifetime, but it's happening at an accelerated rate right now. 
that even for me, even as someone who's always expected this, it kind of scares the shit out of me to watch. So, you know, have plan B, have plan C, have plan D. Right, right. Um, and I, I've been thinking that way for, for years and, you know, I'm still definitely scared by looking at it because I'm like, oh, shit, look at it. It's happening uh, quicker and in a way that I wasn't expecting. And yeah. yeah, there's not, you know, and now, of course, it's getting to this point where it's like, uh, it's harder to leave, of course, now, right. too, yeah. because now the EU is, for the mm -hmm. time being, not letting people from the United States come there. Yeah. You're limited on where you can go. But, you know, that won't last forever. I mean, that is that will become a battle here very quickly, um, a battle between economics and public health that very well may be disastrous for the EU. But, you know, lucky for you all, that's our problem. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think, you know, Americans will not be banned from here forever. But, you know, start reimagining what your lives could be. You know, like, what are you willing to die for? And what are you willing to sacrifice? And can you envision a completely different life than what you're living now? You know, envision what you can possibly lose and prepare for the future and prepare for a myriad of different scenarios. Because I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I, I one, one thing I'm very confident of is, you know, how the average person is living right now will not exist in 10 years. Yeah, I, I would add that I think people should be learning practical skills as well. Yep. You know, yep. learn to preserve food, learn to grow food, learn how to kill a chicken, you know, like build community, start talking to your neighbors, like figure out what's native to your region, figure out what grows in the forest, what you can eat, what you can't. Yep. All those practical skills that the 20th century kind of shrugged off. Those are going to become very important again. Yeah, we saw this spring how, you know, so many people were talking about gardening, you know, <laughs> and bread. Yep. yeah, and, and one result of that was that a lot of seed companies uh, got slammed and a lot of them ran out of seed. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I saw that. yeah, that was a big deal, you know, and, you know, and you combine yeah. that with the fact that, uh, well, growing food is not that fucking easy to do. No, it's, it's actually a really a challenge, you know, yeah. And, and, and so, so many people don't, I, I hear, I mean, living in Oregon for a decade, the amount of like stoned hippies that would come, yeah, man, everything's falling apart. We're just going to go, we're just going to go live off the grid. I'm like, you, you don't know how to live off the grid. Like, do you even know what that means? We're going to grow our own food, man. Like, no, you're not. You don't know how to guard it. You, 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 you like, stop it. Like you, you, that's, that's like, that's not something that you just decide to do. That's a skill. That's a that's a very very specific skill that that takes a whole lot of learning. And yeah, like I think people need to start learning those skills. You know, I, I've tried you know itty bitty bitty here and there. I've, I've I've been trying myself, but I think you know, especially anyone who's serious about that, like start learning now. Uh, start learning now. Well, Ali, it was really great to uh, to meet you in this way. I really appreciate you taking some time. Yes, you too. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.